Eh, muy, muy buenas tardes, bienvenidos a un nuevo eh, encuentro de Encounter in Spain. Welcome to the YouTube channel of Instituto Cervantes in Leeds and Manchester to this new uh, event of uh, Encounter in Spain in a series of uh, events uh, where we present the diversity of, of Spain from the perspective of the uh, British travelers of the 19th and the 20th century. Travelers and spats who saw Spain from a different perspective, not uh, uh, more, the most useful places to be visited at that time, but uh, uh, rather, let's say in a certain way, exotic for the 19th century places like in this is we have already presented Galicia, also Madrid, and tonight we will present the Basque country. The coordinator of the of this series is Dr. Christy Hooper, who is a professor of uh, Warwick University and is a specialist in Spanish, Anglo Spanish, and Galician cultural history since 1800. Her books include uh, the um, Writing Galicia into the World, 28th event, Mondariz Vigo Santiago, A Brief History of Galicia's Edwardian Tourists, Boom and the variants and the making of the modern Spanish obsession. She currently holds a Liber Hulman major research fellowship for the project Hispanic London, culture, commerce and community in the 19th century city, 2020-2023. And as I said today, our discussion will be a focus on the region of the Basque country a region of the north of Spain where the Basque along the Spanish languages are spoken. The Basque country became very popular as a destination for the British seeking new cultural experiences and adventures. And some of them, as it would be explained by uh, Christie, uh, were attracted by it, uh, the huge mountains, the landscapes, the traditions, and uh, we're really fascinated by that. Just to mention two very prominent uh, travelers, we have Richard Ford in 1831, who uh, wrote the Handbook for Travelers in Spain, and uh, also Copé, who wrote The Country of the Basque, both, as I say, fascinated by this very deeply uh, interesting uh, region of Spain where not only the language, but the characteristic of the people, the whole society are very unique. Today, the Basque country is a huge, has a culture, huge cultural, sorry, uh, offers. And just to mention for some of the things that makes the Basque country so attractive, we have, for example, the International Film Festival in San Sebastian, which takes place after some uh, many, many years now. The, uh, Guggenheim uh, Museum in Bilbao, one of the uh, paramount uh, architecture museums in Europe. And uh, also we had to, to uh, mention the best the extraordinary gastronomy and the wines of the, of the Basque country. I won't speak anymore. Just to thank you again, Christy Hooper for this uh, uh, so interesting series. And uh, without giving you the floor, I would like to remind you that we will find at the end 15 minutes for questions and answers that you can put on your chat. And also, I have the pleasure to announce you that our next uh, uh, event in this series of Encounter in Spain will be on the 22nd of November, and we will go far from the, the Berian Peninsula to the Canary Islands. So welcome, bienvenidos, y Christy, tienes la palabra. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias y bienvenidos a todos. Um, thank you very much indeed. It's, it's lovely to be back, um, as you've just heard, for the third in our series of uh, encounters with Spain. Um, as you've heard, we've already visited Galicia and Madrid. And today we're going to visit the Basque country in the company of a series of writers from a range of backgrounds who spent significant periods of time there. Um, so we're going to meet Catherine Exley, who was there in 1813, John Francis Bacon and Richard Ford in the 1830s, Marguerite Tolomac and Richard Ramage Lawson, sorry, William Ramage Lawson in the late 19th century, and Edgar Wigram at the beginning of the 20th. So I'm going to begin 
uh, unsurprisingly, with the divining event of 19th century Britain's relationship with the Basque Country, the Peninsular War of 1808 to 1813, where more than 200,000 British soldiers saw action in Spain and Portugal, simulating what David Howarth calls a massive emotional investment back home in Spain and its future. The Basque Country entered the British military frame of reference in the spring and summer of 1813, when Wellington marched more than 120,000 Allied troops across northern Spain to beat the French at the Battle of Vitoria. It was a wet and miserable summer in the Basque Country, and Wellington's army suffered tremendously from sickness and diversion. After the victory at Vitoria, they suffered losses at Maya and Roncesvalles in the Navarrese Pyrenees before turning the tide again by taking San Sebastian, crossing the river Vidasoa and liberating Pamplona. The war gave hundreds of thousands of Britons first-hand experience of Spain, which they soon shared with the British reading public through copious written and sometimes artistic testimony of their time in the country. Immediately after the war and in the following decades, diaries, correspondence and memoirs flooded onto the market. The Edwardian historian Charles Oman, writing on the war's centenary, recorded more than a hundred first-hand examples. The one I've chosen to share with you today, however, is an unusual one that didn't come to Oman's attention, um, but which has been recently republished in a book, which you can just about see there. So um, this is the war diary of Yorkshire-born Catherine Exley, which was first published uh, in her local newspaper um, up in Yorkshire. Uh, and in her diary, Catherine Exley describes her experiences following her husband's regiment for four years through the Iberian Peninsula. Having landed in Portugal in July 1809, Catherine buried two children before giving birth to a son, Thomas, who somehow survived the appalling conditions in which the regiment and its followers traveled. Catherine eventually made it to the Basque country and she was alongside the 34th regiment on the 21st of June, 1813, as they broke the French army at the Battle of Vitoria. And Catherine recalled in her diary that the evening before the action, we were encamped on a hillside and at two in the morning, we were ordered to march, though little expecting to engage that day. As we passed along, the fire on the road showed where the French had encamped the night before. As usual, I marched with the regiment. I know not how to desire, describe the scenes I witnessed on this awful day. The first shot given to my feelings arose from the sight of a man's head severed from the body and sent a considerable distance by a gun. Despite the constant terror, Catherine was resourceful, um, searching through French, abandoned French supplies for food for her son, despite the widespread fear that the enemy had poisoned anything left behind. She found the climate dreadfully hot, but eager to play her part, she wrote, I advanced to the plains and offered my assistance to the surgeons. It is impossible for me, she writes to describe the agony of the poor creatures as they lay weltering in their blood and gasping for breath. I tore the linen off my back to bind up their wounds and was instantly employed fetching water to quench the thirst of the dying. All of this she did with her baby son strapped to her back. Constantly in fear for her husband's life, Catherine eventually joined the regiment's other women in an abandoned house in a nearby village, where she says, we lay down on the floor to sleep all ignorant of the fate of our husbands. The following day, they walked into Vitoria to find the regiment, passing dozens of maimed and dying French prisoners before at last locating their men three leagues out of the town. Catherine's experience was vivid, terrifying and exhausting. And unsurprisingly, she has few words to spare for the aesthetic pleasures of the country in which she found herself. Uh, a rare example of Catherine commenting on the landscape is after visit, uh, leaving Vittoria, where the company spent several weeks marching upwards into the Pyrenees. In going down the hills, she writes, which were very steep and slippery, we were exposed to great danger and were compelled to take off our shoes and walk barefoot. The ascent was still more arduous. I had to crawl up on my hands and feet, having my child on my back. She recalled the immense forest they passed through, the largest I ever saw, and remembered that the road was excellent, but there was not a single house to be seen for many days. 
Up in the mountains, they encamped in the most uncomfortable conditions. Catherine recalling that on the lofty heights of the mountain, we lay so near the clouds and there was such a constant drizzle and rain that we were often unable to distinguish one another. Catherine's husband was taken prisoner at the Battle of Maya and devastated, she and her son eventually made their way back to England by ship to await his release. Catherine's vivid and uncompromising account of her uncomfortable close-up encounter with the Basque battlefields full of severed heads, putrid corpses and driving rain is an unusual female authored contribution to what will become, as we'll see, a century long British practice of writing the region through the lens of Anglo-Spanish military engagements. Less than two decades after the end of the Peninsular War, Spain was at war again. The death of Fernando VII in 1833 plunged the country into the first of three wars of succession, known as the Carlist Wars, after the very conservative faction who supported the claims of Fernando's brother Carlos to the throne over those of the new queen, Fernando's baby daughter, Isabel. The Basque country was once again the focus of the vicious fighting during the first Carlist War, which lasted from 1833 until 1840. In 1836, the British government, who supported the monarchy, sent the British Auxiliary Legion, a volunteer force of some 10,000 men, to the Basque country, where they fought for two years against a resourceful Carlist army. Unsurprisingly, the renewal of British military involvement in the Basque country generated increased public interest in a Britain still fascinated by the events of the Peninsular War, and many of the participants once again published accounts of their experiences. The story of the Legion itself passed into the very British tradition of heroic failure, cemented some 70 years later with the publication of the adventure novel with the British Legion, a story of the Carlist Wars, by the very popular author of Boy's Own Military and Colonial Adventure Stories, G.A. Henty. Now, Henty, of course, was, was writing 70 years after the event, but one interesting first-hand account is that of the London-born merchant, John Francis Bacon. Uh, it has a pithy title, deep breath, six years in Biscay, comprising a personal narrative of the sieges of Bilbao in June 1835 and October to December 1836, and of the principal events which occurred in the city in the Basque provinces during the years 1830 to 1837 published in London in 1838. At the time the war broke out, Bacon, a liberal and supporter of Queen Isabel over the Carlists, was a newly married man in his 30s, living in Bilbao with his Basque wife, Atanasia Martinez de Revilla. Bacon frames the busy, well-organized Basque provinces as a counterpoint to what he calls the oriental indolence of southern Spain. He finds the Basque provinces egalitarian, blessed with such an equal distribution of property that the extremes of rich and poor are hardly known. Indeed, he writes, the Basque provinces resemble the small republics of Greece and Italy in their best days. Now, this isn't to say that all is perfect here. Bacon's key objective in writing his book was to counter the romanticized writings of some of his pro carlist countrymen, who suggest, as he says, that no such thing as tyranny or oppression ever existed in the happy valleys of Biscay and Gipuzkoa. Sorry am I to destroy the illusion, he writes, but truth obliges me to say that from 1830 to 1833, I witnessed more acts of cruelty and oppression for political offences than probably have occurred in Great Britain ever since the peace of 1815. And in illustration, he gives the um, example of his friend, uh, Don Emeterio Landesa, who was accused of having stuck his knife into a portrait of the king, Fernando VII, which some zealous loyalist had drawn with a burnt stick upon the walls of a wine shop. Uh, and his friend was condemned to death and forced to flee to England. Um, and in fact, um, Bacon's one of Bacon's very first tasks on returning to England himself in 1837 was to, to act as executor for his, his friend, uh, Emeterio Landesa, who died in, in Hoxton at the age of just 38. Um, nor did Bacon himself escape entirely, being summoned by the Carlist supported Catholic Inquisition, along with an English friend and fellow merchant, as he said, to prove their filiation, that is to prove that they were of noble blood and of clean lineage, not descended from Jews or infidels and good Catholics. 
Bacon gives a vivid eyewitness account of the first day of the war in Bilbao in October 1833, when hearing what he called a considerable tumult in the streets, he went outside to find out what was going on and ended up being roughly interrogated by parties of armed men. In the Plaza Vieja, he said, I found a large body of the royalists under arms, loudly cheering for Carlos V. It was enough. The veil was rent, the die cast. I beheld the first scene of this eventful drama. And again, um, Bacon reports on his friend's experiences uh, throughout the war, including an assault on the aged and inoffensive Don Vicente de Landesa, the theft of a mare, saddle and spurs from the respectable merchant Don Diego McMahon, and the demand for a tax contribution of over a thousand pounds from two English mercantile houses who he said very properly refused to pay it. Bacon's view of the Basque country is firmly framed within the conflict of the Carlist War, and specifically with his desire to defend his liberal and anti-Carlist position to an English speaking audience. It's worth noting that the book was written in October 1837, when the conflict was still ongoing. Um, and it's worth noting as well that it came out almost simultaneously in Spanish translation uh, in Bilbao. But in terms of Bacon's encounter with the Basque country, the book provides an unusual foreigner's eye account into civilian life in Bilbao during the conflict, especially among the middle class merchant community of which Bacon, his wife and their diverse Anglo-Basque social and professional circle formed a part. But perhaps the most influential 19th century British writer on the Basque country, indeed on, on Spain in general, was Richard Ford. Richard Ford arrived in Spain with his family in 1830 uh, and stayed for three years, during which time he left the family in Granada, where they had rooms at the Alhambra, um, and he himself roamed the country on horseback. He was a professional expert on Spain. He was a reviewer, commentator, art critic. For almost 30 years, he was the London media's first port of call for views on Spain. More than 10 years after his return to England, he compiled his recollections into the highly idiosyncratic and incredibly long handbook for travelers in Spain and readers at home. It was first published in 1845 as part of John Murray's popular handbook series. And Ford's handbook swiftly became the go-to Victorian guide to Spain. Um, and it was stayed in print until 1899. Now, Ford's overall attitude to Spain is one of a muscular disdain and an unshakable sense of British superiority. And I've written elsewhere about the way he frames the country and especially its southern and eastern part in acutely Orientalist terms. As we're going to see, however, his depiction of the Basque country is rather different. Introducing the Basque provinces, as he calls them, to his readers, Ford employs the well-oiled strategy of translating Basque geography and identity through comparison to other more familiar examples. This corner of the land, he writes, like how Wales is the home of the remnant of the Aboriginal inhabitants, who whenever pressed upon by foreign invaders have taken refuge in its rugged retreats. Thus unsubdued, the character of an unadulterated primitive race remains strongly marked in language and nationality. This strongly marked linguistic and national character Ford dismisses as simple pride. Like other Highlanders, he says, these Basques are grievously affected with genealogy and goiter. Peppery as the Welsh, proud as Lucifer and combustible as his matches, these pauper peers fire up when their pedigree is questioned. He is absolutely dismissive of the Basque language, remarking that the Basques, as becomes a people sui generis, have a language of their own, which few but themselves can understand, nor is it worth the trouble of learning as it is without a written literature. While the conversation with the natives is scarcely of that high intellectual quality that repays the study. Ford rejects Basque scholars' writings on their own language and culture, noting that our readers are cautioned against the wild theories and treatises of Basque antiquarians, which rival those of Ireland. Rather than Basque experts, he recommends Humboldt, a critical German and free from national prejudices and predilection as the safest guide. 
happiest when able to draw on the authority of the classical canon, Ford summoned the classical authors Strabo and Pliny to support his lack of respect for the Basque language, remarking that after such authorities, we too protest against being held responsible for the spelling or meaning of any Basque word which we may be compelled to use. As a handbook designed to guide British travellers around unfamiliar Spain, Ford's work provided not only cultural and historical context presented, as we've seen from his standard position of lofty superiority, but also practical information designed to show the reader both what to see and how to make sense of it. Overall, Ford has relatively little to say about the aesthetic qualities of the Basque landscape. And what he does have to say, he's content to repeat as often as needed. So in his overview of the region, he sort of summarizes it saying, the limited attractions offered to strangers are chiefly those of nature, for the towns are without social, historical or artistical attraction, while the villages have been almost all ravaged during the civil wars. The chief towns have few charms, except to commercial travellers, for the Republican inmates have neither palaces nor picture galleries. The towns are Swiss-like, surrounded with green hills and enlivened by clear trout streams, and the Alamedas are pretty, a juego de pelota, or fives court, and a public plaza are seldom wanting. And that description of towns as Swiss-like reappears frequently. So Vergara, for example, is a Swiss-like town on the banks of the Deva, the route to Tolosa is a Swiss-like country intersected by trout streams, while the road from Apeitia to Tolosa is a charming pastoral Swiss-like ride, especially the last four or five miles amongst the hills, wild woods and longleaf chestnuts. Uh, Ford's equally fond of his pretty Alamedas and his usual five courts, and those adjectives become more or less standard copy for multiple towns. The Gipotcoan town of Oyazun about midway between Irun and San Sebastian, hits the jackpot with both a pretty Alameda and the usual fives court, a combination that wins it the rare accolade from fraud, from fraud Ford of picturesque. Beyond these repeated motifs, Ford finds little worthy of comment. In Vittoria, other than the Casa Consistorial, he says, there is little to be seen. In Bilbao, similarly, there is very little to be seen. The city is purely mercantile and possesses no fine art. San Sebastian, which has risen like a phoenix from the ashes of the Civil War, is more convenient than picturesque. And yes, here again, there is little to be seen. If one does determine to visit such places where so little is to be seen, Ford provides some rather half-hearted practical advice, largely regarding hotels and transport which in this pre-railway age meant the diligence or wheeled horse-drawn carriage, horseback as, as he traveled, or the coastal steamer, which he preferred to the bridle road for traveling between Bilbao and San Sebastian. For the tour from Irun to San Sebastian and Tolosa, however, he recommends the now sadly unfamiliar cacole, or mule-mounted litter, noting in a very rare mention of the, the fairer sex, that ladies may ride this tour on cacole, on quiet and prudent donkeys. I don't know about you, but I have never met a donkey that was either quiet or prudent, so good luck to them. I said just now um, that Ford's attention to the aesthetic and practical dimension of travel in the Basque country was somewhat half-hearted, at least in comparison with his treatment of other parts of Spain. And this is because his interest in the Basque provinces is so very, very heavily focused elsewhere, and specifically on their place in British military history. So the Peninsula War had ended just 15 years before Ford arrived in Spain for the extended stay that gave rise to the handbook, while he and his family left the country shortly before the outbreak of what he calls the recent murderous civil wars in 1833. The British public's unprecedented emotional investment in the nation's uh, military support of Spain across the two conflicts meant that the names and stories of Basque battle sites such as Vitoria would have been entirely familiar to Ford's English readers. Ford's reading of the two countries' shared military history, however, is framed by his bitter and persistent effort emphasis on what he considers historic Basque ingratitude for selfless British support. Basque treatment to British soldiers, he writes, from the Black Prince down to Sir de Lacey Evans, has always been the reverse of friendly, even when fighting their battles. Each time he arrives at a city, 
Ford conjures its role in this treatment, often citing British military dispatches to give his words authority. So in Victoria, for example, the inhabitants denied all assistance to our wounded. General Evans and his legion were left to rot like dogs in damp vaults, unaided and not even pitted by those who ruled in Victoria. Similarly, he says, the Fuente Rabians begrudged during winter time, even lodging to our sick. Nay, those authorities wished to take away even the hard boards on which our disabled were stretched. And these, said the Duke, are the people to whom we have given medicines, whose wounded and sick we have taken into our hospitals, and to whom we have rendered every service in our power after having recovered their country from the enemy. Um, and he has similar things to say about Tolosa and Bilbao, among others. In repeating these stories and in bolstering them with these copious scholarly references to Wellington's dispatches, Ford depicts a peculiar relationship between Britons and Basques, in which apparently altruistic military aid, is there such a thing, is greeted with inexplicable hostility. It hardly seems calculated, does it, to encourage British visitors to make the Basque country a destination. Throughout his descriptions of each tour, Ford incorporates lengthy accounts of the military events taking place at each location. To the extent that large parts of the handbook's Basque chapter read less as a travel guide than as a military history, in which the vivid physical and social scars of the first Carlist War that had ripped through the region a few years earlier are layered upon the semi-sacralized sites of the Peninsular War less than two decades earlier, which themselves rest upon the echoes of the quasi-legendary military encounters of medieval Britain and Spain. Now, sometimes these are just passing references, as in Salvatierra, safe ground, a name which Joseph, resting for the first time after his flight from Vittoria, must have thought very appropriate. But at other times, they allow Ford to make wider political points, so, for example, um, talking about Guernica, he remarks that the Casas Consistoriales and more than half the town were burnt in 1808 by the French Republicans, those preachers of universal freedom and philanthropy. These theorists who planted sham trees of liberty and real guillotines at home cut down the true oak of the free Basques. And if Guernica allows Ford to disparage the French, San Sebastian gives him the opportunity to big up his home nation, dismissing what he calls the standing libel of the Spanish accusation that Wellington's troops purposely burned the city because it traded with France. As if, he writes, this paltry, beggarly Basque port could incite the jealousy of the masters of the world's commerce. But Ford's view of the British isn't all positive. He has little good to say about the British Auxiliary Legion in the Carlist War, whom he sees as less as heroic failures and more as incompetent idealists. At Hernani, for example, he notes that here the Legion, under General Evans, almost as soon as they had landed, made a needless reconnaissance which ended in a repulse, trifling, however, complete to their total defeat on the same ground in March 1837. Nothing could impede the Carlist advance and the legion turned and fled. Approaching Bilbao, he writes, is Arigorriga, where Espartero and General Evans were defeated by the Carlists on the 11th of September, 1835. In a rare example of attention to picturesque detail, here he notes that the Ponte Nuevo did near the scene of battle is made for the artist. In contrast to the legion, he credits the English sailors under Captains Ebsworth, Lappage, Henry and Lord John Hay with what he calls the real work of liberating Bilbao in June 1835. They defended the trenches, they supplied food and arms, for the Cristinos were in want of everything at the critical moment, the poor soldiers having been neglected as usual by their pauper government. And here, after several paragraphs of heavy battlefield detail, Ford seems to suddenly remember his readers when he advises that those who wish to see these sites will obtain an excellent view from Los Capuchinos. So I'm going to finish up um, this discussion of Richard Ford's view of the Basque country with just a word about industry. As I've written elsewhere, Ford was notoriously interested and notoriously well informed about the commercial and industrial opportunities Spain offered to British investors and his approach to the Basque country, of course, is no different. As ever, he is scathing about the Spanish capacity for making the most of Spain's own natural resources. 
At Lethal, for example, he draws the reader's attention to what once was a celebrated dockyard, which Spanish neglect has allowed to be choked up. The once excellent port has from carelessness been much injured by deposits. He's especially interested in Basque iron, has precise detail, for example, about the iron ore to be, qu to be quarried at Mondragon, yields at least 40% of the finest metal, he says. And he recommends a visit to the Fonderia de Iraeta ironworks outside Aspaitia. In Somorostro, where about 6,000 tons of iron, he tells us, are made annually, he laments the economic protectionism that enables Spanish iron, a dear and bad article, to compete with English iron. He dismisses the mining and smithers as primitively rude, although he notes with satisfaction that foreigners, the British among them, of course, are slowly introducing more scientific methods. Richard Ford's writing on the Basque provinces demonstrates the same unshakable sense of British superiority and disdain for his subject as the rest of his work. But it's also quite unique in his use of the filter of war, imbuing each site with the history and memory of military events to such a great extent that the tourist experience, which the handbook is nominally designed to provide, becomes something of an afterthought. So, Although Ford's handbook remained a key text for British travellers to Spain for more than half a century, going through multiple editions until the final one in 1899, the country Ford had known was transformed almost out of recognition within a decade of its first publication, as the development of the Spanish railway network meant that the train rapidly overtook the diligence, horses, and sadly also their cacole as an attractive mode of transport for visitors always accessible from British ports by water. The Basque country came within even easier reach by land in 1864, when the rapidly growing Spanish railway network reached the French border at Irun, and a shiny modern station was opened at San Sebastian. An early visitor on this route was the seasoned traveler and artist, Marguerite Tolomac, who made the journey from France in 1869, publishing her experience the following year as Spanish towns and Spanish pictures. Three short hours from Bayonne, she writes, you are at San Sebastian, you have crossed the Bidasoa, you are in Spain. Despite the short distance, Ptolemac found that the change from France to Spain is immediately felt. French will no longer help you, you must speak Spanish or you must have a servant who can. She was very impressed by San Sebastian's hotels and their very commendable system of charging so much per head per day, saving the traveller much trouble and all doubt as to expense. Tolmac didn't stay in Sebastian for very long at all before making her way to Burgos by the morning train. Um, and she records two, just two items of interest in the town. The first one um, is the result of her mission in, in the book overall of making better known to her readers some facts relating to the Spanish church, which may be interesting for readers in Catholic Spain. Uh, and that was to an unnamed place of worship in San Sebastian. The first Spanish church that is visited, she writes, has a strange effect upon the mind. And though the specimen at San Sebastian is but a poor one, it nevertheless puts to flight all preconceived notions of the interior of the church. She found it gorgeous and magnificent on the one hand, but also with a strange barbaric effect, noting that the open space without seats of any kind has a novel aspect to English travellers, even if it possessed no other charm. Tolmac's depiction of the second site she visited in San Sebastian echoes the pattern established by Ford in framing the Basque country through a tourist gaze deeply inflected by the memory of war. You have a grand view, she writes, of the Bay of Biscay from the heights above the town. And as we turned to look at the graves of the English soldiers who fell here during the Peninsular War, our English eyes rested gratefully on the rich tufts of primroses, blooming even more vigorously amongst these gravestones than in our own hedgerows. Twenty years after Ptolemac, the financial journalist William Ramage Lawson visited Spain, publishing his memoirs in Spain of Today, a descriptive industrial and financial survey of the peninsula uh, that appeared in 1890. Lawson arrived in Spain via the now established tourist route by rail from Biarritz with his Murray and Bradshaw guides in hand to take the risk of spending a hot month in Spain and of seeing the country from end to end. 
emulating Ford's characteristic combination of the aesthetic, the industrial and the patriotic, Lawson's objective is to visit British industrial sites in Spain and gauge their health for himself. And he's pleased to note that San Sebastian is now a flourishing port, having completely recovered from the sad knocking about it got in the Carlist War. The first stop on Lawson's tour was to the hematite mines of Bilbao. It has become a fashion of late, he notes, especially among promoters of rival iron mines, to speak of Bilbao as being on the wane, although he disagrees with this view and he provides so many statistics to support his case. His primary source, who I, I suspect was also his host in the city, um, is a gentleman he refers to as Acting Consul La Rea, who appears to have been very struck by the visit to Bilbao of Spain's Queen Regent in 1887, given the amount of space that Lawson devotes to an occasion that took place a good two years before his own visit. But Lawson is impressed with Bilbao um, and with the province of Vizcaya, which he considers altogether a peculiar and highly privileged corner of Spain which seems to have everything that a community can wish for, whether in political distinction or commercial property. He admires the city, its busy quays, its beautiful river Nervion, lined with ships of all nations, its gay streets and its unspanish air of activity. Indeed, for Lawson, Bilbao's success lies in that unspanishness, and more precisely in its characteristic balance of what he says, conservatism and loyalty to the Spanish crown on the one hand, and on the other, the tempering of this conservatism by foreign blood and enterprise. Bilbao itself, he observes, is almost entirely the creation of British and German capital. From the last third of the 19th century onwards, the proliferation of railways, industrial colonies and Atlantic facing ports of call began to change the shape of British imagined geographies of Spain, giving a new prominence alongside the sunny south of Andalusia to what Albert Calvert glibly sketches as the black north and the thriving east of the kingdom. The Basque country is an increasingly familiar entry point by both rail and sea, played an important part in this reorientation, which is crystallized in the iconic Bidecker travel guides, which finally reached Spain in 1898. Bidecker was, of course, largely concerned with the most popular tourist routes, expecting his visitors to arrive in the country either by ship or increasingly by train via France. So his tour number one, therefore, runs from Irun, a charmingly situated and comparatively modern town via San Sebastian into Castile. When it comes to the Basque country, Baidecker's choices have much in common with Ford half a century earlier. Baidecker too reaches for the comparison with Switzerland and the Alps, finding that the character of this picturesque district is so thoroughly that of Central Europe that it is very easy to fancy oneself among the lower parts of the Bavarian or Austrian Alps. The words picturesque and alpine feature heavily in the detailed route guidance, advising the reader of things to be seen from the train. Although crossing the narrow girder bridge across the Oyazun, he warns readers keen to make the most of their experience that heads should not be protruded from the windows. Although Baidecker has much more to say than his predecessor about the aesthetic qualities of Basque landscapes, towns and cities, he shares with Ford that interpretative framework for the Basque country that resides above all in the memory sites of Anglo-Spanish military encounters. For example, Baidecker recommends that on arriving at Irun, those who wish to add a glimpse of the departed glories of heroic Spain to their enjoyment of the green and smiling landscape should not omit to visit Puente Rabia, where Wellington and his army made their famous passage of the Bidasoa. In each town or city, Baidek appoints travellers towards the battlegrounds and their inevitable corollaries, the burial grounds of the Peninsula and Carlist Wars. In Bilbao, for example, readers are advised of walks, very attractive, to the English cemetery on the left bank of the Nervion, below the new town. Many British officers are buried here. In San Sebastian, too, readers are sent on an agreeable walk along the slopes of the Monte Urgul, where on the north side, halfway up, are the graves of the British officers who fell here in 1813 and 1836. A notable difference between Baidecker's approach and Ford's 
is in Baidecker's distinctly less jingoistic view of British military activity. So, for example, where Ford defended British troops sacking of San Sebastian in 1813 as entirely normal according to all the usages of war and dismissed Spanish complaints as libel, Baidecker observes with disgust that the excesses of the Victorian soldiery on this occasion form a lasting disgrace to the British army. Similarly, where Ford celebrates that San Sebastian was gallantly saved on December the 13th, 1836 from the Carlist by Colonel of Oslot and the Legion, without whom it must have fallen, since he says the Spanish hadn't bothered preparing their artillery for its defence. Baidicker simply notes that in 1835 to 36, the town and fortress were heroically defended by the citizens with the aid of some British auxiliaries. Like Ford again, Baidecker draws his reader's attention to Basque industry and infrastructure, now vastly expanded from Ford's time and still developing fast. So in Bilbao, for example, he comments how the river Nervion has been so much improved by a process of canalisation that ships of 4,000 tonnes burden can enter it at high tide. While the large outer harbour is formed by two breakwaters, one on the west near Santorce, while the other on the east near Algorta is in course of construction. Baidek is not immune, of course, so from the temptation to talk up the impact of British industry and commerce on the city. Bill Bow, he says, owes its prosperity mainly to the extensive deposits of iron ore on the left bank of the Nervium. Between 1882 and 1896, about 55 million tonnes are exported, chiefly to Great Britain and in British ships. So building on the work of Richard Ford half a century earlier in his pioneering travel guide, Baidecker sketches a double view of the Basque country where the thriving Anglo-Basque industrial complex is overlaid on the memory sites of British military encounters, albeit as we've seen with a far more critical and less jingoistic tone than his predecessor. So, the last traveller to the Basque country that we're going to meet today is Edgar Wigram, uh, better known as an artist and architect than as a writer, who travelled northern Spain by bicycle early in the 20th century. Uh, and in 1906, he published his travel log and more than 70 of his own fine sketches and watercolours in the volume Northern Spain, painted and described by Edgar T. A. Wigram. Um, and for those of you who are interested in British art, British paintings of Spain, um, Edgar Wigram ended up as the mayor of St Albans in Hertfordshire um, and as a result St Albans Museum holds those sketches and watercolours in its collections um, so you know you can you can go there and see them um, and they really are very fine indeed. So back to 1906, um, over the course of several tours Wigram made his way by bicycle from Bilbao along the north coast of Spain through Cantabria, Asturias, Leon, Galicia, then turning south through the old Castilian cities of Zamora, Salamanca, Avila, Toledo, Segovia and Burgos before returning through Navarre to the French border. It's very clear that Wigram set off for Spain expecting to find the exotic semi-wild landscape beloved of the Romantics. In his preface to the book he situates Spain and its people whom he describes as the echo of the east as just temperately primitive, that is primitive enough to give the traveller a taste of Eastern exoticism, but not so strongly that he need fear any discomfort. These expectations, which were well met elsewhere on his travels, were both reinforced and challenged by his experience of the Basque country. Wigram's book opens with an exchange of messages between himself and his friend W, uh, discussing their plans for an early summer bicycling holiday. Having dismissed Norway and Provence, they're excited by the offer of a sailing to Bilbao, which raises the prospect of a tour of Spain. Uh, the ship they were offered turns out to be the Amadeo, one of the colliers or coal transporters that ploughed between the pine docks and the British run steelworks at Bilbao. So having come about purely by the chance of being able to hitch a ride on board the Amadeo, their initial encounter with the Basque country was entirely the product of those Anglo-Basque industrial connections. Nonetheless, Wigram's personal frame of reference was as an artist, and this is largely how he approached what he saw. The Amadeo being, as Wigram put it, no greyhound, uh, it was after almost a week at sea that they finally approached the port of Bilbao. 
For Wigram, the well-traveled artist, the first view of the seaward approach to Bilbao rivaled his first view of Genoa and the Italian Riviera. He writes, the romantic hills reared themselves from the water's edge, unwinding their veils at the touch of the early sunshine, and the sparkling villages clinging to the cliffs from the shell-shaped harbour of Porto Galete made a picture which might have been borrowed from Lugano or Lucerne. Beyond the purely picturesque, however, another layer is visible. A tumult of tossing peaks was piled in disorder to the eastward, above the smoke of the iron furnaces in the winding valley of the Nervium and far away to the westward, ridge upon ridge fell sloping down into the blue waters of the Atlantic, sometimes breaking off so sheer at the finish that the oar ships could actually moor alongside to load. As the pair clear customs collect their bikes and set out westward, Bilbao's industrial activity gradually overshadows Wigram's initial picturesque impression. The busy industries of Bilbao have unfortunately gone some way towards marring its lovely situation. Its valley is choked with smoky factories and its mountains are one vast red scar from base to summit, the entire face having been flayed away for ironstone and ladled out into the ore ships along the aerial railway to feed the blast furnaces of Sheffield and Middlesbrough. Our uglier trades seem to take malicious delight in ruining the prettiest landscapes. It's only once they're far enough along the coast that these details are concealed by distance that Wigram sets down his bike and sets up his eagle, easel, painting Bilbao from the little port town of Castro Urdiales. And that's the painting that you can see behind me if I move slightly out of the way. Um, in Wigram's painting, um, hopefully you can see the destructive industrial aspects of Bilbao were erased by, by distance. Here, there are no chimneys, no smoke clouds, and only one moderately sized, that way, ship. Following this artist's gaze from across the Cantabrian border in Castro Ordiales, one would barely know an industrial colossus lay between those peaks. But if Wigram's introduction to the Basque country and to Spain was through industrial Bilbao, his farewell at the end of his tour is filtered through the military memory sites so familiar from the works of his predecessors. Wigram's route out of Spain took him through Navarre and Vitoria, past sites layered with memories, such as the Englishman's Hill, which has been twice baptised in the blood of our nation, once with the slaughter of a detachment of the Black Prince's army on the eve of the Battle of Navarrete, and again, when Picton's fighting devils came against it in the crisis of the Battle of Victoria, cutting their path through the centre of King Joseph's tottering array. As it was in the days of Las Navas de Tolosa, writes Wigwam, so was it also in this crowning mercy of the Peninsular War. Wigram's journey ends where ours began, between the Pamplona Basin and the Basque Pyrenees, where Catherine Exley confronted her first severed head on the battlefield of Victoria and later shivered in the rain-swept mountains, wondering if she would ever see her soldier husband again. For Wigram, writing almost a century later, not only are the events Exley witnessed in the freezing bloody flesh converted into a combination of schoolboy rote and semi-mythologized military glory, but they're secondary to his own personal transformation. Cycling steadily upwards into the sun-beaten mountains towards the French border, he and his companions shed their outer garments one after another until we eventually emerged at the further end in an almost Aboriginal state casting off the garb of civilization for the garb of Adam before sinking with relief, and we have to assume stark naked, into a roadside pool. Wigram's encounter with the Basque country is, is really a double encounter. His jarring first vision of ultra-modern industrial Bilbao, tamed and made palatable by distance and his artist's eye, is counterbalanced by his passage out of Spain by the Basque and Navarrese military memory sites that plunge him back in time to a kind of sweaty cyclist's rebirth high in the frontier lands of the Pyrenees. So to conclude, uh, Edgar Wigram's doubling counter with the Basque country, the way he struggles to frame the industrial as aesthetic and collapses time around specific military memory sites, is an extreme example of the very particular role the Basque country came to play in 19th century British travellers' encounters with Spain. Once the vivid wartime testimony of Exley and Bacon had faded into history, 
This duality shapes Ford's patriotic cynicism as much as Tolomac's tidy tourism and Lawson's brisk and profit-oriented industrialism. While each account was inevitably shaped by the specificities of the context within which it is written, one thing they all share is their vision of the Basque country, less as a window into its own history and culture than as a mirror with which to reflect back aspects of 19th century Britain's own history and purpose, located as much in the smoke and chimneys of the Anglo-Basque industrial complex as in the ghosts and echoes of its battlefields and burial grounds. Thank you. Thank you, Christy. It's a wonderful talk as usual. And now the floor is open for questions that you might have from our audience or comments. You are very welcome. But it's all right if you don't have any as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, this uh, tradition of travelers, of uh, British travelers to, to the Basque country, um, as you have explained, there were many, many reasons why they, they but how was the, the, the relevant uh, role also women? Because when we saw the, 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 uh, the travelers in, in Galicia, the, the role of women was, was quite important in the Basque country, the profile is different, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there are people like Marguerite Tolomac and of course, Catherine Exley, whose experience was quite different. Um, and increasingly with um, the development of the railway, um, as I said, the Basque country sort of became the opening to lots of people's experience of Spain, but not all of them wrote about it. Um, so fewer, fewer prominent women. I think that the Galicia is, is quite unique in the number of women who devoted complete books yeah. to it. That's unique really um, throughout Spain. Um, but yeah, there certainly were female travellers. And as we saw with Marguerite Tolomac, they had quite a different um, perspective from their male counterparts as well. Um... I can see Blanca's comment. I can't believe they, sorry, maybe uh, I, I can't yeah, believe I they compare it to Switzerland. I wonder what the purpose of this fantasized version was. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a great point, Blanca. Um, it's really, it is really interesting. And actually, it wasn't just the Basque country, because one of the women that we were just talking about uh, wrote a whole book about Galicia, calling it the Switzerland of Spain. Um, but I think that in this case, I, I think that the, the authors simply didn't have the vocabulary to discuss the Basque country directly. So, uh, you know, as we all do, they found, lo they looked for analogies. And I think that they felt that the Basque country had like big mountains and was quite green. Um, and so Switzerland would have been the familiar analogy um, for something like that. But yeah, um, it's, it, it's, it's quite strange and it's quite strange how they they take the label things like swiss like and they just apply it to everything without really explaining what they mean by it yes the the aerography of the mountains are yeah it's different but there are some similarities in the landscape uh, the you know the the pyrenees and the alps are different range of mountains but uh, and the rural, yeah, it's very different. Yes, actually, it's very different, but uh, um, there might, might be some similarities. Have you got any more questions or uh, comments? If not, I would like to thank you again, Christy. It's uh, really a delight to, to hear you in each uh, uh, presentation of uh, these different aspects of the Spain and the, the travelers, British travelers who discovered the country in the 19th and the early 20th century. As I mentioned, our next uh, event would be on the 22nd of November. And uh, Christy Hooper will speak about the Canary Islands. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias. And see you soon to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks thank for you. having me. And thank you, everybody. Thank you. Gracias.